Aging is an inevitable process of life, and one we assume will gradually take away more and more of our ability to live, love, and learn. No one likes the idea of deteriorating faculties. The question then becomes, what can we do about it? Some facts of life may be inevitable, but that doesn't mean that we are completely helpless to succumb to Father Time. When we craft a lifestyle by design, we can actively take steps to reduce, regulate, and in some cases reverse some of the aspects of aging. The first and most important step to impacting the aging process is nutrition. What we put into our bodies consistently, year after year, can have an incredible impact on not only our longevity, but the quality of life associated with it. Monitoring our nutrition and developing a successful dietary plan is without question the best way to maintain a healthy and active lifestyle. Simply creating a meal plan eliminates stress and decision fatigue. A healthy diet accompanied by regular exercise will help you live longer, happier, and ultimately make you more successful. Annie Goudreau, like so many of us, focused all her efforts on her career and found great satisfaction as a highly successful marketing executive. But after achieving this corporate success, Annie realized she was unfulfilled and unfamiliar with the person and lifestyle she created. Changing her perspective and focusing inward, Annie didn't just shift careers, she shifted her lifestyle to one that was in alignment with the woman she was and the ideal she wanted. Many marathons and triathlons later, this certified nutritionist now specializes in helping other women understand the aging process and adopt a new lifestyle for themselves. Hear how to whip up healthy meals, improve performance, and age with grace in my conversation with Annie Goudreau. Everything kind of started to derail, but it didn't, it was not like, Oh my God, you know, I lost my house and my business went out and all of that. It, it was kind of one thing that got on top of the other. So I, I was going through relationships like people drink coffee, you know, mm. I didn't. And, and I don't mean just romantic type. I, I was, I had friends who unfriended me way before Facebook yeah. and they said, I'm sorry, but you always prioritize work and you cancel all the time. That's not cool. You're not available. You're not a good friend. And I was just like, ah, oh, well, you know, like the signs were there. As I said, I was just not listening. Right. Wow. And I did not want to listen. And so, but, you know, add, add the romantic level too. So I would have these relationships and it was just like, Hey, you know what? It's my way or the highway. And I also never, fully gave a hundred percent I had this beautiful you know barrier and nobody was getting in or once in a while you could get a little peek inside right and that was that and then I'd be like okay that's enough you know so you know it it accumulated accumulated and um, so that was going on on one side and uh, my dad started to be sick it's slowly and because my mom had been unavailable, my ties to my father, I think, were pretty, pretty solid and really, really deep. And um, it was a very scary moment. And I felt, I felt my life was really unraveling. Oh, and on top of that, I really had like a very, very bad romantic relationship where I was quite ashamed of the, of the relationship that I had um, gone into and thought, even with my wounds, that was a new low for me. It was so bad that I thought, okay, I, I no longer meet, I can no longer continue because I'm so ashamed of my behavior. I could no longer. It was like an justify. abusive situation or something like that? No, no, but he, he, um, it was just such a person that was not at all. Uh, at my level of of um, 
um, how should I say, such a level of immaturity, such a such a manipulative, jealous type that I thought that's a new low for me to pick somebody that is just not healthy. Exactly. For you, right? kind of and even though I was not healthy, emotionally speaking, um, you know, I, I didn't. That wasn't helping, certainly. No, exactly. <laughs> right. And um, when friends saw that, they were like, what is going on here? So right. I, I was deeply ashamed of that. And so if you put all these things together, it was, oh, my God, you know, what am I doing here? And I am profoundly unhappy. And if I'm going to, if I'm starting, I didn't even want to say if my dad dies at the time, but I thought, oh my God, my poor father is going through this. I'm feeling this pain because he is going through this. How how am I supposed to, you know, have the resilience required to get through this? I am so broken. And, you know, I was finally admitting that I was broken, that I, I had this empty barrel, you know, there was, there was nothing spiritually there. There was no good energy. I was depleted and I had buried everything so deep um, that it was just not sustainable. So we, I, I believe that we all have eventually to touch the bottom and I had touched the bottom. So what were those first steps like? What what was that first kind of turning point moment? What did what that look like for you? Because this because uh, you know we don't just overnight just no all of a sudden. I mean we may have a we may have that aha moment, but it still takes time and progress to start like digging our way out of that hole. So well, what was that like for you? It was interesting because so my dad becoming sick opened up an opportunity for the two of us to have conversations that we never had about my mother. So you started getting, yeah, that's cool. Right? So conversations that everyone was avoiding and that. Addressing core issues, like going right to the source, man. Totally. Because he had witnessed what had happened. He had witnessed the abuse. And uh, so I'm starting to get some answers from him. I'm starting to feel that I can release also some anger because I was so angry at him. For allowing it to happen. Yeah. And you, you always think also that we need to find somebody's responsible. Somebody must be responsible. Right. And of course, in this case, you get to understand that no one was responsible. It was just unfortunate and it was bad luck. And she did not choose this. He did not know he was ill-equipped. And then the list goes on. So I could finally let go of Somebody must be responsible. And then I need to have anger towards that person, right? And I started to find that there was a lot of forgiveness that was happening. We were finally getting to the truth, right? We were finally getting to the truth. So that was happening. At the same time, I happened to live downtown here in Toronto. And I'm one day on my way to the subway, which is I don't know, seven or eight minute walk from my home. And I always, I always walk. I don't take the streetcar. And I passed in front of someone's office. There was a little sign and it said, blah, 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 psychotherapist. And I took a picture with my phone and on my way home, I called and I left a message and I said, I need you. And I, I had never known anyone who used her. Um, I just felt this is serendipity. It's five minutes from the house. And I also know very well that in life, we're always looking for a little escape. And I thought, this is right beside my house. There won't be any excuses. You know, it's walk three blocks. I got to show up no matter what. Even if if I've got the flu, I don't care. I will show up. (laughs) I don't have to drive. I will be in that chair and I'm going to do the work. I, I think that it, it was probably, I was lucky um, that I, I had made that commitment that I was going to get better no matter what it took. For sure. You know, there was a, there's a certain, say, there, somebody said this somewhere and I don't know whom, so please forgive me for not giving you the credit, but it said every time that you do something and you keep on repeating it, somehow it's working for you. 
And I believe that for the first time in my life, my, be- my previous behaviors and my previous actions were no longer working for me at any level. What was protecting me first no longer was protecting me. It was only hurting me. All my, all my systems and all my, my, uh, my defense mechanisms, they were all hurting me. They had served me earlier on, you know, as a five-year-old and a six-year-old and a seven-year-old. Right. They got you through the situation at the time. That's right. It got me to become an adult that was not an addict. But, you know, I was suffering just like an addict is suffering. They still had a lot of unhealthy behaviors that were keeping you from your ultimate self. Yes. And from the outside, because I was not an alcoholic or I was not a uh, eating disorder, you know, right. um, but I was um, I was a mean person. I used people and did not care. I just took what I needed. That's pretty profound. It was, uh, you know, there's nothing that you're proud of there. But uh, that's the truth. It takes guts to say that. It's the, Even just to say it out loud, that's, you know, damn. it was about just, it was about survival. I always looked at everything as a survival mechanism. So what can I take from this? How do I protect myself? How do I make sure that, you know, the line's not going to eat me? And okay, I'm, I'm good. Right? I'm good. So I'm curious, what were some of the tools that you gained from that psychotherapy that you were able to implement to get to where you are now in this healthier oh, mind state? It was amazing. It was truly amazing, um, that process. And it's funny, you know, people say, oh, my God, you must have loved that woman. And I particularly did not like her. It's not funny. It's the it's very warped. If, it's kind of like that AA thing, like when they pair you up with a a, a mentor guy that that you don't particularly like them and they don't get you know it's like but whatever it is there's that connection that makes it work and it's and it's almost that antagonistic relationship that makes it more effective i feel like i think i you know i think that you're probably right i never never thought about it that way uh, because i always used to think oh my gosh she annoys me and she was so rigorous you know and i was like oh god but What I got from her, one of the many, many things in terms of systems that have really helped me is I was always in a judgment mode. I was always very busy judging situations because I had been in survival mode before. So I always had to be judging. And the biggest, the biggest shift that happened is that instead of going in judging, I was always open. Let me observe what's going on. And a shift in mindset, huge, what is going on truly. And then always coming from a place of understanding before I judge. So let me understand truly. Oh, is this person behave this way? Let me understand what that behavior is all about. Where are you coming from? Seek to understand first, right? That good old principle. I was able to do that because I no longer was, I no longer needed to protect myself. You know, the six-year-old girl always needed to protect herself. As an adult, I no longer need to do that. You know, I need to be smart, just like everybody else. I need to be street smart. I need to do the things that I need to do like everyone else, but full stop. And I approach, I approach things that way now for everything. And the fact that I approach things also with forgiveness is that I don't waste energy on shit anymore. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. Beautiful. I don't, yeah. you know, like, well, when <laughs> Toronto is normally a really crazy traffic city and, um, you know, if somebody cuts you off, you know, I'd be like, eh, whatever. I no longer get into this whole, you know, and then you must be an asshole and this and that and this and that and making up all these stories and nonsense. And if people do make choices that I don't like, I don't spend energy on it. Their choice, your life. I'm going to focus on my life. Thank you. Nice knowing you. I'm not going to shift my focus on where it needs to be. What I love about that is while that sounds selfish and like self, like I'm just going to do my thing. I'm like, on its base, it sounds like it's, well, it's all about me. Really what it is, is it's the exact opposite. It's you're shifting 
And I see this time and time again. We're, we're so caught, that inward mentality. We're always looking at, like how you were saying before, like you would judge the situation and you would like analyze it all. It was all about like how, okay, well, how's it going to affect me? It's all this internal thing about me, 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 me. But then once you have that shift of outward perspective, and it's like, okay, now let me just understand what's going on out here. Let me understand what this guy's doing and why he's doing what he's doing. Let me understand the situation. And you're open to this new experience because you dealt with the trauma, because you processed all that other stuff. Yes. Now it's like, now it's this outward mentality yes. and this outward way of looking at things. And it's just that shift, man, if we could get everybody to just understand that shift in mentality, but you're, but the reason why is because we have trauma that we haven't dealt with. We're all dealing with these, ways that we've been wronged or these ways that we've been hurt it yeah these these traumas in our life for lack of a better word but um man when you take the time to process when you take the time to analyze and when you're able to get to have like what you had with your dad an adult conversation versus the child adult conversation yes the adult versus the adult conversation it just changes the dynamic it changes the empathy it changes oh, everything that you it's oh, so it's liberating just, Yes, liberating is a great word for it. Great word for it. It's totally liberating. And you, you know, it's interesting that you refer to that selfish thing because taking care of the things that I need to take care of allowed me to become, to show the generous person that it allows me. you to be the good person for others. Yes. It allows you, like, you can't take care of other people when you're a train wreck. Oh. You just can't do it. You have to get your house in order. That's what I was. I was a champion of selfishness and a champion of, you know, what is those, those things, a bulldozer, right? It was just like, get out of my way or I'm going to crush yeah. you. Yeah. Right. And that uh, mentality. very much so. Very. Well, let's talk about that type A personality because mm. that type A personality has served you well in one regard yes. and that's with triathlon in particular. I want to spend a little bit. I, there's no way that two Ironmen can get together and talk and not go into <laughs> triathlon at least briefly because we apologize to all the listeners right now. <laughs> yeah. So everybody can go ahead and tune out now for the next 10 or 15 minutes. We'll come back to some uh, more meaningful content eventually, but triathlon, um, that definitely takes a type of A personality. Tell me about how you um, got into that and, and what your uh, what your experience has been like. How that's kind of served you. Running was my first uh, foray into official exercise, and I did it as an answer to being too stressed. And an executive coach had guided me to pick up something, anything. And I liked running because it was easy. It was accessible. You don't need any skills. You just need some running shoes and a good sports bra and off you go, right? You're done. You don't need anything else. And uh, as I progressed in my running journey. Anti-chafing cream. Yes. <laughs> if you're fat like me. <laughs> Sorry. I had to throw that in there. Yeah. It's also really lovely to have it for the, for the sports bras. Very nice. Yes. Bras. Um, Serves its purpose. I think I, ha I had a crush and an admiration for Ironman, the very, very long distance triathlon for those who don't know what that is, um, because there's many different distances within just like running. Marathon is only one distance. Iron Man is another. And I felt so intrigued and, of course, crazy scared about it. And one day happened to have an opportunity where I jumped on it, it to sign for my first Iron Man. But even when I signed, I was not fully committed, you know, I because I didn't tell anyone. I didn't tell anyone for the longest time. And I remember the first time, the first time I told someone, I had just done one of those um, – 100k for a charity bike ride and we were in a school bus they were taking us back to where our cars had been the starting point and the person that was in my team uh, happened to sit beside me and he's like oh so Annie you're gonna do another ma another marathon and I was like oh, actually I, I signed up for something different and he was like oh yeah what and I was like oh you know just a little triathlon and then he was like <laughs> he was like uh, so tell me more, like what kind of triathlon? And I said, I signed up for an Ironman. And he screamed in the bus, what? 
you sign for an Ironman? I wanted to die under that seat. And of course, you know those seats, right? There's nowhere to go. They're meant for little children. And I'm 5'10". No There's nowhere I'm going anywhere. And I was like, shh, don't say anything. Don't say anything. And um, I was not even able to own up to it yet. So, yes, that was the start. <laughs> it got real, real quick. <laughs> oh, boy. And, and this this is actually, if some if I could share that with the listeners, is that the moment you start to talk about it, the moment that you say it and you say it and you say it again, really helps. It really helps taking the power that that word has on you. It makes it real. Yes. And you start to also think, you know, this is real and I am also capable. I am yes. capable because I will do what is required for me to do this. I love that. Yeah. And that's the only kind of mentality you can have with Iron Man in particular. How many triathlons did you do before you jumped into the full balloon? One. Wow. One. Nice. Excellent. Me too. I should have done more to just practice transitions <laughs> and, and uh, the water yeah. component was very, very intimidating to me. The running component was, you know, what I was looking forward to, quotation mark. <laughs> in theory. <laughs> yes, but I was not uh, looking forward to the water. So having done more races before would have really helped. But I ended up having a very good swim for me. It was not fast, but I had a nice, consistent, good level of energy swim. So I was very happy, but it would have been better to have done more. <laughs> you survived. Hey, it's all about just surviving the swim, right? As long as we survive the swim, it's all downhill from there. Right? Yes, yes. And I was really privileged because I ended up doing my first Ironman in Austria in one of the most beautiful places on earth. It was magnificent, clean water, amazing surroundings. I've heard that one is gorgeous. It was um, phenomenal, phenomenal, and still my favorite to date. Nice. That was one going to be my next question, what your favorite one was. I do want to jump into uh, some of the content that you're producing now. But before we leave triathlon mm -hmm. and marathon and all that kind of stuff, um, I always like to ask my guests that are into this same kind of craziness um, about a wall experience. And for those who don't know, like at some point in a mm -hmm. marathon, at some point in an Ironman the wheels are going to fall off. Everything's going to go wrong. You know, everything's going to just completely fall apart and you feel like the world is crashing down. And that's where a lot of people quit. A lot of people give up and throw in the towel. But if you can see through that, then you find the light in the tunnel. Do you have a wall experience that you'd be willing to share with us? Sure. The first time I hit a wall was actually in running. I was running the Ottawa Marathon and it was not my first. So I think I approached mm. it in a bit of a cocky way. It was maybe my fifth marathon at that time. And um, I was really excited. My father had come. I traveled to Ottawa, which is about a couple of hours from Montreal. So I was really excited. He was there with his wife. I was thrilled to have family there. And um, I completely screwed up my times. So yeah. I ran an extremely fast half. So everything is always relative, right? So a one hour and a half half. Paid and for that. <laughs> I was 25 minutes too fast, like not just eight minutes, nine minutes, 25. So it would have been great <laughs> if the race had been a half marathon, but unfortunately I had another 21 and I, I went into such a dark place at uh, about 30 K and um, I, I unraveled. And this is before I had done any of my therapy work, right? We're talking uh, a long time ago. And I, my, the type A Annie, the judging Annie, the unforgiving Annie, the ugliest sides of me all came out at once. And I was depleted, you know, of nutrition. And because I was, I was so focused on beating myself up which was, you know, something that I did frequently, I, I could see nowhere to go. And my ego was like, well, you are a loser because clearly now you've fucked up your overall time. I had to walk, which I was ashamed of. It's like losers walk. <laughs> you know, I win. How quickly that perspective no. changes. <laughs> <laughs> but I also thought, you know, fine, you want to run, run, but right. that's not me. I, I am a bigger yeah. than that 
my ego was so big that I could not see anything. And um, there is a photo of me when we were back at the hotel and I'm white as a sheet. I am not in a good place. I am not in a healthy place. And clearly, you know, because I could have over, right. not completely overcome, of course, I had blown it. But I could have decided now that, you know, this is the grown up and he was 52, um, you know, sees, okay, I could have been like, wow, can you believe I made that mistake? And then um, adjust nutrition, adjust, et cetera, everything. And then decide to slow down so significantly that it would have been able to enjoy the rest of the, you know, the privilege. Because it is a privilege to get to run marathons. It is a privilege, you know. That's such a great statement. But no, I was, yeah. I was in no privilege mode. <laughs> and uh, so I could, you know, there was a way to shift. But I refused to shift. I was dogmatic about being in my judgment and focusing on all the things that I had done wrong as opposed to what right. can I do right now? Because what's done is done, right? I, I have blown it. Um, nice. So that, that was my first wall. I learned a lot from that race. Excellent. It seems kind of a little bit like a natural progression for you um, with having started in marathon and then gotten into triathlon as you were doing this life shift kind of thing as well um, and jumping into the nutrition. So let's talk about, uh, again, from the longevity perspective is where I really hope to dive in deep with this kind of stuff. But doing triathlon was the first time I ever took nutrition seriously. I've always been the fat guy that loves to eat. Um, I'm a foodie at heart, but like once you start doing triathlon, you realize for the first, for me, for the first time, like, what proper nutrition does to your body and, and the advantage that it gives you out on the race course or through your training and all that. So uh, tell me about the, the nutrition aspect of this. Well, it started interesting enough because as a result of the first Ironman, you know, when you do an Ironman, a lot of people are very curious about the experience, right? And it, while you're training and so on, it's one thing. And then you come back and you've got your photos and you're like, Ooh, look at this medal. And you know, you're, you know, obviously you're very proud and, and so on. And I would talk, I would be talking about that. And a lot of the questions that people started to ask was, how can you train for an Ironman while you were running a business? It started there. And I started to go to different groups and speak about the, my experience. I had to reflect on how did I manage it? And I started to, to research the concept of energy. So where time is a finite resource, because regardless of what you and I say, we are never going to have more than 24 hours per day. However, what I discovered through this, through this process was, oh my God, energy is expandable. And when we look at people that achieve so much in their lives and we go, how do they do it? Well, it's because they have the recipe to manage their energy and to expand their energy. And that was a massive light bulb moment for me because I had never been exposed to that. We all learn, especially if you are on the corporate side, you know, you get all these emails about how to be pro more productive, time management, how to manage your inbox. And those are good tools. Those are great tools to know. And you should know these things. But nobody teaches you how to expand your energy. And there started my journey on, there's a lot more here than what we've been led to believe. And people started to be curious about the nutrition part of it, because I used to say, at the base, there's got to be nutrition. And that's when I also realized that besides some, you know, Runner's World magazines and a few books, I really did not know about athletic nutrition and I did not come from a science background uh and interestingly enough my sister had done medical school but I I always thought you know that that was not me that I had been the creative person in, in the household and mm -hmm. um so I decided I actually think that I could go back to school to become a nutritionist so that I really understand what that foundation is based on and it was first class 
that I had was like, boom, I am so in my element. Why didn't I do science? And, you know, because I, I, there is, I did not realize I was such a geek. Well, but you appreciated it more at that point too, I feel yes. like. Yeah. Because, because of putting in the work of doing triathlon and stuff, be, you have a different perspective on it for sure. Yes, exactly. And it, it, it helped, right? I was not in my 20s. I was in my 40s. Another shift in perspective too. Yeah. I mean, cause like, again, like when you're 20, you can eat Twinkies and get away with it and, <laughs> and go run the next day and not have any, like the, the repercussions are, are so much less noticeable when you have that higher metabolism and that higher energy state. But, um, so uh, this is a great segue. This is something that I've always struggled with and I'm always trying to learn more about. So from your perspective, what did you learn? What, what are the biggest shifts that we need to make? What are the, some of the takeaways? Um, biggest takeaways were around the fact that there is so much misunderstanding about all macronutrients, right? What we call macronutrients, the proteins, the carbs, and the fats. Because in each of these categories of foods, there's good quality stuff and there's less quality stuff. And then to go back to my previous concept of energy, some things give you energy and some things drain you of energy. Everything in life is, is that chemistry, that polarity, the positive charges and the negative charges. And in food, the same thing. So upping protein, decreasing complex carbs and having really good fats all the time at every meal and every snack that you have. That if you, if you continue and you master that, you will have sustained energy all the time. You will have high level of energy and you will not also do the wear and tear and damage that comes with bad nutrition and accelerate your aging process. But we'll talk about aging later. Right? But it, that's one of the biggest thing is that we misunderstand what these big categories of nutrients are. And we think that we have to eliminate things completely. Whereas, no, they all have a very critical role to play. But we need to do proportions properly. And when you are training, you need more energy. Well, I was going to say that was the one, the one perk for me for, for doing triathlons is the fact that you did get to get away with a lot more bad eating habits <laughs> on, on a you know, on a regular basis, when you're training like crazy for Ironman, you get away with a lot more. Yes. Um, but then when you stop and once you've had the race and the race is over, man, if you don't have that eating in check, I mean, I've, I've ballooned up pretty much after every race I've done a little bit mm -hmm. from some of that. So a lot of folks aren't at the level of doing Ironman yet or looking to even get to that level of nutrition. Although I do want to spend some time talking about nutrition from the aspect of anti-inflammatory perspective and the aging perspective. But before we get away from that, um, just from entry level, somebody that's just trying to begin to implement changes in their diet and exercise, because a lot of the things that I talk about uh, on the show and in, and, and in some of my live posts are about just taking these little small steps. So what are like the top, say, five things that you see like the average guy doing wrong that would be easy to correct to see some big gains? You start seeing changes as soon as you start making your food. That's a big thing. So, so making your food. Yeah. You know, spending some time in the kitchen, not having aspirations to become Jamie Oliver, <laughs> and, you know, but really, and I actually would argue Jamie Oliver is a nice, nice, simple cook to follow recipes from. I was going to say, actually, his methodology is brilliant. I love yes. that guy. He's, he's not intimidating whatsoever. But starting to eat real foods, I hear people say all the time, ah, oh, it's cheaper to buy the rotisserie chicken from X than to, to cook it. The problem is it's full of bad stuff, right? So spending a little bit of time in the kitchen, cooking, going back to the basics, is the first thing, right? Very, very, very first thing. So that's that's one thing. And then every time that you eat, making sure that you are looking at how can I increase my vegetables? This is one of the big key areas for for health. And I call it health right now, for right after and forever. At each meal, I always ask myself, for example, how can I cook for us here at home and add a little bit more? 
oh, okay, I'm going to go back in the fridge and I'm going to see if I have another, you know, half a pepper to throw in there, a, l- a little bit, a little bit more broccoli. Oh, look at that. We've got that spinach. It's not looking too great. Let's throw it in there, right? Let's cook it. I like that. Every time that I'm eating, I think about how can I make this just a little bit more interesting? Because most of us know the fundamentals. And that's what I see in my practice. Most of us know, but we forget to just go back to how do I apply this? Every, because you eat three times a day, not always, twice a day for some people, but at each meal, how can you do this? How can you add a little bit more every time? I like that. The other thing is you got to stop eating early in the evening. That really helps with energy. Or late in the evening. <laughs> yes, that's, that's right. even worse. <laughs> yes. And I'm from European that's- descent. Yeah, you'd like to eat late. We frequently have dinner at 7.30, 8, 8.30 p.m., you know, and it's it's hard. I know, I try. I don't do it 100% of the time, but I would say 90% of the time we're, you know, by 7 o'clock. It really helps your digestion. It really helps have a better sleep and that you feel so much better energy the day, the day after. And it allows you to have proper fasting. You know, there's a lot of buzzwords around intermittent fasting, but all it means is hours where you're not eating. Well, during the night, for most of us, we're not in the fridge, you know, eating, we're sleeping. So having 12 hours of natural fasting is perfect for the body, really helps the body process, digest and eliminate because, you know, there's an overemphasis on the food that we ingest then we forget that two more things need to happen. The, need, the food needs to be digested. So that means it needs to be broken down into such small piece that it can be absorbed by the body. And that seems obvious, but for a lot of people, it's actually a massive issue. They eat well, but they digest terribly. So if you find yourself bloated all the time, if you have a lot of gases, if you have cramps in your stomach, it's all signs that your digestion is not is not happening properly. So kale or no kale Mm -hmm. is not the issue is are you ingesting great food, digesting properly, and then eliminating properly. And those are three separate things. They're very, they're very, it's like electrical system in your house, and the plumbing, and the heating. They are all important. And they all need to work well. But they're all different, uh, different things. I love the analogy. Said my eight keys to greater are based on construction principles. So that fit right into my wheelhouse. Perfectly. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. I love Perfect. it. Yeah. Um, well, so before we, I do want to talk about the anti-aging stuff, but before mm-hmm. we leave this, um, you brought up uh, the digestion and, and the and the elimination of food after you've processed it. And that brings up an issue that I'm fascinated by because it's an issue that my wife struggles with. And you see a lot of Americans in particular struggling with the ulcerative colitis and the yeah. uh, what's the, the Crohn's disease, I guess is the other name for it when it's where it's that particularly that back end of the digestive process. That's right. That seems to be rampant. Oh, yes. In our society nowadays. What's your take on that? It really points to all of the health, the health habits that we've had, not just the things that we ate last month, but a lifetime. It's a lifetime. So uh, the colon and the small intestine have extremely important roles. And believe it or not, but even though they're, they're quite long, like the you know, small intestine is quite long, um, it's made at a very fragile surface. And think about it as, you know, when I, here's a good analogy. So it's summer. I'm from Toronto. In the winter, we need to wear boots and, you know, socks and et cetera. And in the summer, you start wearing your shoes without socks, right? And you get this like chafing. And if you walk too long, you're going to have massive blisters. So over time, if you keep on wearing those shoes and you're not letting it repair, you're going to have a blister and then it's going to it's going to be very painful because you'll have eliminated that first little delicate skin right and then it's really really painful and unless you're dealing with it you're not going to be able to wear those shoes again and 
when we eat food that is repetitively irritating to the system, it's the same thing that we're doing. We are damaging that layer and we're letting things into enter the body that should have normally not enter the system. So you, you don't have a colitis issue or Crohn's disease without having a problem with what you are putting in your body first and foremost. So first the food and then the ability to digest. Well, that's interesting. You said it was a, a chronic type of situation where it takes time. That certainly yes. by definition fits to our yeah. situation. That's pretty interesting. So um, shifting gears a little bit, I do want to hit the anti-aging stuff. Mm. So from as a nutritionist, talk to me about this anti-aging uh, what, what are some of the tips, things we should be doing, uh, things I should be doing in particular for myself? <laughs> well, the first thing people need to know is that there is so much that we can do, both from a diet and lifestyle standpoint, to uh, really uh, optimize our health outcome for the long term, to live better, to live better, stronger, and to have even more energy as we age. And that is possible. The myth is that with age comes decline. The truth is decline comes because you have not done anything and you have neglected, just like your house, you know, you need to change the windows once in, you know, once every 20 years and a roof once in a while needs to be, you know, maintained and everything in between. But if I don't do anything, I'm going to arrive and I'm gonna go, holy shit, the whole house needs to be bulldozed and we need to start all over. That's what happens with the decline that we observe, whether it's cognitive or that it's the body. It's not age the culprit. It's your bad habits and your environment that are the culprits. And I know that's hard to hear. Mm -hmm. But the positive spin on this is that we have the ability to change these outcomes. We have the ability to go from and this is a myth as well. I have bad genes. By the way, there is a whole science called epigenetics that is the science of understanding how genes express themselves. So it's not because your whole family had diabetes that you are necessarily going to have diabetes. But if you do all the bad lifestyle stuff that they do, guaranteed that you're on your way to developing that condition. So epigenetics actually shows. So as humans, by the way, we have about 25,000 genes. And we thought when we started the genome project that we were going to find that we have over 100,000. And that was a big surprise to the scientists. They were like, oh, because we think of ourselves so superior, right? So we must have so much more genes than every other species on Earth. The fact is that we don't. And there are only seven genes in the body that are responsible for aging. Think about it. Seven, but there's 25,000 genes total. So every day, everything that you do, from your sleep to your nutrition, to how you nourish your brain, to your emotional health, to what surrounds you in terms of environmental health, all of these things affect your gene expression. And what I mean by that is either we're going to keep the gene healthy and strong and resilient, or we're going to uh, make them sluggish and we are, they're going to get dusted and they are eventually going to start to say, mm, you know, I'm not exactly uh, healthy. And that's how disease sets. So nutritionally, what we, what we know and that is scientifically, scientifically proven is that a diet that is whole foods, you know, the whole Michael Pollan thing is pretty accurate. Eat whole foods. So things that are minimally processed, keep things real. So spend more time in the kitchen, more vegetables. We know these are key things. We know that having protein, but not extreme amounts, but not low, low, low amounts are also important within that. Keep sugar at bay. Never eat fast food. Stay away from trans fats. Those are the key things. It's very difficult for our society, especially North America and Canada is no different, you know, sugars and everything. That's why, you know, I, I live a busy life like everybody else. It's not like I have five hours in the morning to prepare three perfect meals like Martha Stewart, you know. But 
those are the proven principles to really help with anti-aging. If you want to stay away from inflammatory foods, stay away from these hydrogenated oils. I actually have an amazing oil, good healthy fats guide. I'll talk about it at the end that people can download on my website. Uh, because again, that's an area of a lot of confusion. People started to have canola oil and safflower oil and all those oils that are massively inflammatories. We need to go back to what we know the body deals with very well, like extra virgin olive oil, for example. Really, really very, very, very helpful. Everybody that is wants to age in a healthy way, boost your omega-3s. So what does that mean? Your cold water fish, all these little fish that lives in these uh, cold oceans, very happy, you know, so tuna and salmon and trout and sardines, all these things are high, high, high in omega-3s. And they are amazing for your neurons and keeping the, you know, it's, it's like a car. It needs um, constant, nice lube. And um, that's what it does. So those are proven to really help. And then in the latest science, what we also know is glutathione, which is an amino acid, also as a supplement, really helps um, with healthy aging as well. So there are a lot of things, but how we hurt ourselves is by excess processed foods. The sugar, unfortunately, is the big culprit as part of this equation, you know, and it's hard to get away from. It's hard to get away from that one. Yeah, I mean, it's it's unavoidable if you're eating uh, out, like if you're going out places. Well, and what I find really interesting is like, it's really interesting because we get more and more information and more and more understanding of what we should do and it seems like even though we we seem to understand what we should do better and better each time we still seem to be headed in the wrong direction like as a society we still seem to be doing a lot of the unhealthy things and a lot of the unhealthy behaviors um from your perspective what's some of the worst advice that you hear out there what's one of the ones that you want to dispel as far as like the information that you see out there the vegetable oils, first of all. Vegetable oil ones. That's it's probably one of the biggest. It causes a lot of GI issues for a lot of people. What's your take on the coconut oil? Have it. You like it? Full stop. Yeah. Avocados, all these natural, the, the oils and nuts, excellent. Uh, healthy fats. Healthy fats are very, very, very important. I was going to ask, you brought that up earlier, your, those fats that are really so important for us. What's your favorite healthy fat? Um, I like a mixture. So I'm a big um, extra virgin olive oil fan. Unfortunately, you have to buy, you know, qu quality ones. They're expensive, but I'd rather sacrifice in other places in order to have better quality fats. Do you guys have Aldi up there? No, we don't, unfortunately. Uh, that's one of the only places I've been able to find really good quality olive oil for really, really? a really reasonable price. Yeah. Oh. You know, they got the test where you stick it in the fridge and if it gets cloudy or whatever, you know, the quality or whatnot. So mm -hmm. I did that with some Aldi ones and I found a really good one. So. And it was a really reasonable price. So oh, pleased. fantastic. Well, that's a great yeah. tip for your listeners right now. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody in the States that has Aldi, check them out. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah um, fantastic. Um, so that's, that's definitely one of the, one of the big ones. And the other ones is how you don't think there is sugar in savory foods, but it's everywhere. Um, and one of the, the big ones that trick people is the marketing that has been done around yogurt and how yogurt is really good for you. And that's true. But 98% of the yogurt you buy is trash and it's, it's garbage. It's, and it's a sacrilege. Because at the foundation of it, yogurt is really good. So always choose plain yogurt and go for the Greek style because it has more protein for you. So you might as well, you know, boost your nutrition every time that you eat. You know, how can you up the antis and then put your own fruit on it? You know, a little bit of berries, that's all you need. But not a lot of fruit. And this is another misnomer. You know, you should not eat too much fruit because fructose unlike other types of sugar, goes directly directly to your liver. It's a bit like monopoly, you know, like you don't pass go, collect to 100, it's the same thing. So it goes right to the liver and then it gets into fats. So you do not want to be excessively 
uh, ingesting a lot of a lot of fructose. So that's of course the number one type of sugar in fruit, hence the name. So have a little bit, a bit of fruit when it's in season, right? So the peaches are going to come soon. That's great. You know, have a peach, but that's it. You know, like don't buy this fruit all year round. A little bit of berries is probably the only thing that I think is really good because it's got a lot of antioxidants and it's very low glycemic and it won't mess up your blood sugar levels. So what is your favorite sugar of the three? You know, uh, you know, there's there's more nutrients in maple syrup than in honey or than in, you know, glucose per se. But the quantities you have to eat, which should be very small, you know, we're talking very, very, very small amount of minerals. So, you know, you're really, uh, it's not true that it's necessarily way better because you should keep it in small quantities. So as, as long as it's, you know, good unpasteurized honey, maple syrup, yes, but they should all still be in, in very, very small quantities in your diet. So all of these things are, are great in practice and in theory. We all know, again, we're talking about there's so much information about what we should do. Yeah. Um, but then when you go to put this into practice and you talk to specifically about um, getting in there and getting hands on making your meals. And that's something that I've always enjoyed doing just from having experience working in restaurants. I've always mm. uh, been the, I'm the cook in our family. So I'm feeding the masses. Um, <laughs> so from an everyday perspective, when we're trying to feed kids and we're trying to deal with the hubbub and everything else like that, give me some tips as the main chef of the house of something that some, just some easy things that I can do to help it maintain a healthier family. The biggest thing is like anything else that you want to be successful in life, you have to have a plan. You have to have a plan to get it done. So if I say I want to keep my family with my three kids and my wife and my husband and I want to be healthy, it's got to be a plan. And that means you have to figure out in advance what's going to be the week. I'm a huge planner. There is no success without a good plan. So a good plan means you have to dedicate some time to what are going to be the three, four key meals of the week. And then the rest of the time, we're going to play with some leftovers and miss and match, right? And then having a super well-stocked freezer. I'm a big fan of having a great freezer stock. I have tons of frozen vegetables in there, bags of berries. I have, you know, chicken breasts and all kinds of things that are, are pre-portioned. And then, you know, like tonight, we Wednesday is date night uh, at home. And, you know, I did not like research for five hours online what was going to make special. You know, date night is really just an occasion to throw a little bit of romance. <laughs> um, but, you know, I just went to the freezer. I pulled out a couple of things. I looked at what were the fresh veggies and we're all set because at the beginning of the week, I made sure that, you know, we had enough vegetables because, you know, there has been already a time that I took on Sunday to pre-cut a whole bunch of stuff. So I've got big zip blocks. And then in the, in the pantry, I've got a whole bunch of good staples, right? You know, so sun-dried tomatoes and olives and things that can inject a little bit of taste and it's still all healthy. Eating healthy doesn't require to be skilled. It requires just a little bit of planning. So that's the biggest thing. Spend some time. And there's tons of wonderful, wonderful resources that are free online now. Show me how to cook a chicken. There's about a thousand, <laughs> right? Any so, that you particularly recommend? Any site specific um, or apps in particular? Yeah, I really like Oh She Glows. It's a, a great app, I find. And she's vegetarian based. And we don't subscribe to a vegetarian based uh, modality at home, but we certainly have a lot of vegetarian meals. So if Peter happens to have, you know, chicken that he wants to throw it on, super easy, right? It'll have a little bit of fat, leftover fish, we throw it on. Uh, that's, that's a great app, and it's like two ninety nine a a month. Super easy. The other one that I really like for people is, is called, it's a weird name, Meal Lime. So meal as in meals and lime as in the fruit. It's free. At the beginning, it asks you to put in your preferences and what are your also your preferences in terms of vegetarian, pescatarian, etc. And then it has all kinds of prep tools and it has reminders. So every Sunday, I have a little thing that pops up and goes, 
any, it's time to prepare meals for the week. You know, the problem with people is not that they have a lack of goals, is that they have a lack of systems to support their goals. So a system is making sure you've got the time. If Sunday doesn't work for you, pick a time, right? We all have different schedules. And then make sure that you do the groceries to support that or order online, whatever are people's preferences right now. And then dedicate the time to have that stuff ready for you in the fridge and in the cupboard. And you're always ready so that you don't go, oh my God, we're going to have to have popcorn for dinner. And it does happen. I know real life happens. You know, I call it, are you stacking the chips on your side or are you letting chance determine? And that's what we do when we just say, oh, I wish I could eat healthy. Like, okay, so where are your systems? I right? put systems in place and everything will fall. Like, so just simple perfectly. when you break it down like that. Yeah. It's brilliant. And it's all these it things I do. And, 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 and it works. Exactly. It does work. 100%. It does. I love it. That's fantastic. No, it's so true. I mean, we, we started doing the, we use the desk calendar, get one of those big desk calendars and just, and we, you know, I would occasionally try for the whole month, but even just getting the weeks in there and just not having that same question. Well, what does everybody want for dinner tonight? What do you want for dinner? What do you, it's like, at least just even having just a little bit of a, and, it, and even if it's on there, Hey, we'll switch it up. And sometimes yes. you know, that, we don't feel like it, but just the fact that it's on the calendar and it's there, man, it makes such a difference to, yeah, oh, yes. I couldn't agree more. And it, it, it takes some, um, it removes the energy space. Yeah. To freeze you to deal with other things. Yes. Remember we talked about energy, right? Yeah. You know, the people who are reinventing the wheel every day, no wonder they go to bed exhausted at night. <laughs> when you are constantly reinventing and you're not automating systems, you are wasting your precious energy on things that are not worth it. Yeah. The area of nutrition and in, in, in this field, we're constantly learning a lot. And we've learned so much over like the last, say, 20 to 50 years. We've, our, our knowledge has increased dramatically. What do you think the next 10 years looks like in this space? What is the future of nutrition and trying to live in this healthy lifestyle? What do you think it's going to look like? I think it's in the field of epigenetics that I referred to before. The understanding of how we can influence gene expression. And that will, one component of it, of course, will be uh, through food. One component will be environment, you know, exposure. And one component will be, you know, activity, movement, uh, and, and all these other dimensions. I think that that's the biggest area of of breakthroughs nutrition is a tough discipline to study because we're not all si you know when one size fits all and uh you know talk about gut health these days your gut composition is very different than mine and therefore when they research things there's a lot of variance so what i think is going to be more important is to really understand what are the factors that allow us to really maximize our own potential with our own genetic background. I think that it is going to blow us away. That's brilliant. I, I could not agree more. I, the aspects of that that I find really fascinating are the one from a, you're, you're predisposed by your ancestry. Like the example I think of is Michaela Peterson and uh, the, she's a real big proponent of the lion diet, but it's also based on the fact that she's like all of her ancestry comes from like Saskatchewan and like the way the outskirts of in the middle of nowhere. So I think that aspect of it is fascinating because that definitely plays an impact on it. But then to the piece that's even more interesting to me, and I would love to go down this rabbit hole on another occasion. We don't have time to, we could do a whole show on it. Is that epigenetics that I, I'm a firm believer that are all these different influences have an impact. It's not just your, your back, your genetic makeup. It's not just your health or, or, or your surroundings. It's all these different things. It's the food that you put into your body. It's the exercise that you're doing. It's that regular routine maintenance like you were talking about earlier. All of those things can, will, I mean, and I, and I think about, about it from the aspect of how it impacts your ability to learn and from the cognitive standpoint, but from your perspective, 
and it affects your your whole disposition, your whole makeup, your your genetic, how you go, how you your body transforms over through this generation, through this lifetime. All of that stuff plays a role, and I just really did a really bad job of trying to explain my point. But um, yeah, that's that's so that's good stuff, man. And I think that what you're trying to say is that we have so much more power and influence on our health outcomes than what we ever imagined. And it puts the onus on us to have agency to be able to make choices that support us. And I think that that is very exciting. Yeah, it's what a great place to be where we can have that impact, man. Yes, and it is very much going in a different direction than where the medical sector is, which is problem patch, right? Because the patch is the meds. And we we are never solving anything. So, and we see the health crisis that we have. You know, we have different healthcare systems, but even us with a, a free you know healthcare system, the burden on society of treating people, the fact that we limit people's potential because we don't realize that there are other ways. You know, epigenetic is, I think, the next thing in 10 years, you know, within the next 10 years. The other place that I think is going to be crazy is mind over matter. What is the influence? We see it with meditation. The science, the research is starting to prove how much of the health markers are improving when people are actually doing meditation. And I, I'm not talking about woo-woo stuff here. I am talking about this peace that we have, this beautiful head and how thoughts influence uh, ourselves. It's pretty incredibly powerful. I don't necessarily understand the mechanism, but I don't really need to understand everything that is in a car to believe that the car can go from here to New York City, right? I just know it does if you do the right thing. I think it's going to be the same thing over the next 10 years. We will know so much more about how we can use the power of the mind. Yeah, well, I think, too, with all this stuff, and I mean, I, I preach a lot about lifestyle design. And with all of these things, it's like all of these little check boxes that you can check off, all these little habits that you can do, they all cumulatively have this positive effect whether it be from the from a nutritional standpoint or whether it be from a a cognitive standpoint or from a physical all of those things it's like it all matters all those little things those little bitty things make a difference especially when you put them all together so we talked about what the future of this industry or if you will is going to be what if everything goes according to plan and all your wildest dreams come true what does the future look like for you 10 years from now? Annie. I will be on stage around the world talking and figuratively and, you know, and physically speaking. Um, <laughs> Virtually and in person, yes. right? <laughs> and, and, and really supporting, supporting women and really changing their views around aging and supporting them in their health and their quest for reclaiming their full potential. And I will have more than one book out there. <laughs> I'll just get through the first one right now, but in 10 years, I should have a few. Um, and I will be serving, serving more and more and more people. Excellent. Well, I think that that's, um, that's beautiful because I think we are on a very similar path. And um, yeah, anytime that you can bring value to folks the way that you're doing and share that experience with others. It's pretty invaluable. I feel like so um, I'm really grateful for you um, sharing your story with us and, and taking the time to be with us mm-hmm. for those who want to know more about you and your site and how to reach out to you to find out more about nutrition, things like that. How do they reach out to you? Best thing to do is just come to the website because everything is there. So the website is Vive. And that's V as in Victor, E-E-V dot C-A. C-A for Canada, people. Vive dot C-A. And I have a number of resources there. So I was talking about the Healthy Fats Guide. I highly encourage people to um, to go. And I also have a great guide that people can download right now, which is called Thriving at Home. What are the strategies that we can implement every day in our life while we're going through 
a lot of the social isolation and we've all, you know, depending on the place where you are, there's been more, you know, isolation than other, but it's all been strange times for all of us. So it's a great guide. And I invite, you know, everyone to go there and um, they can follow me on Facebook and Instagram. All the links are there. So I won't bore everybody with that. Andy, really appreciate you taking the time. And I have no doubt that you're going to see the successes uh, that you aspire to because you're definitely um, doing a lot of the right things and laying a lot of the groundwork. Um, it's very exciting to see somebody on that same path with me. Um, before I let you go, I always want to give everybody a chance to plug any charity or organization that they're involved in um, that they want to give a shout out to just a platform to do so. Um, my biggest thing is actually um, supporting women against domestic violence. So if there are a lot of amazing local organizations, so if there's any opportunity that you may have in your own uh, community, wherever you are, Atlanta, Georgia, New York, Toronto, anywhere in the world, um, support your local uh, shelters that support domestic violence because it's been one of the biggest issue over the last um, since March and it has escalated and it is um, it is a, a big problem. So whenever we can do, you know, write a check, give them donations, whatever you can do, be amazing. Yeah, that's definitely something near and dear to our hearts here. Um, any last uh, words of advice, any parting words? How would you like to be remembered on this show? Uh, any food for thought to leave us with before we let you go? I think I want to remember as the person who says, you know, it's never too, it's, it's never too late and you are never going to be too old. You are never going to be too old. Change that mindset. Well, Annie, thank you so much for your time. And um, we'll look to do this again because I would really like to spend some time uh, diving into some of the wormholes that we could have easily lost time with. But, um, mm, oh yeah. but good you luck with the book this year. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to seeing it. And let us know when it comes out. We'll be sure to plug that and promote it and let everybody know where they can find it. Thank you. And good luck to you as well with yours. All right. Thanks. Take care. Hey, y'all. Thanks for listening. So, what'd you think? What did I miss? Was there a topic you wish we had covered? Was there an area of discussion you want to know more about? Or was the whole thing just too long? Please, send us your questions and feedback on social media to at Extraordinary Podcast or check out our website, ExtraordinaryPodcast.net. Subscribe there for all the latest episodes, blog posts, and more. And if you're tired of living the same old ordinary life, Shoot me an email, nate at extraordinarypodcast.net, and I will send you your own customizable blueprint that will walk you through step-by-step step how to create your own extraordinary life. And if you or someone you know already fits the profile, you can submit a request to be interviewed on the website as well. Finally, if you like what you heard or learned today, please take a moment to like, subscribe, and follow the Extraordinary Podcast on all your favorite platforms like YouTube, Spotify, and iTunes. And if you feel inspired, show your support for the show by donating through Patreon. It is through this financial support that we are able to continue to bring to light ordinary people living extraordinary lives. Thank you for your support, and most of all, just being you. This is Nate G, and we'll see you next week.